Hazards, you wondering how far impalas would f travel in a day during the dry spells to find food and water? Food, um, not that far because impalas are very different to a lot of the other antelopes in that these guys are able to both graze and browse, which means typically they find food a lot easier than what the others do, even though in the drought they did also get quite skinny. In terms of water, they'll travel far, as far as they need to. They'll require water at least once in a day, and so they will travel quite a long distance. Um, you know, I've seen impalas when it was the drought the there was only really water at some of camp and and around elephant plains because at that stage i was on that side and i used to watch the impalas stream all the way from arethusa elephant plains even this side and they would all stream pretty much straight line to those water points and then back out again and so that could be easily four five six kilometers just to go to water so if you double that up for a day because they're going back and forth for, from feeding grounds 10 kilometers in a in a in a sort of during the daylight hours which is, is, a, is a lot for an antelope that probably moves not even a third of that when it's the wet season because there's water and food pretty much everywhere and they're getting a lot of water from the vegetation that they're eating but how beautiful are they in the morning light i think they're one of our most striking looking antelope i know they're common and they're often overlooked but i find them very striking to look at when the light is good and they tend to be very pretty animals that are well groomed and always kind of in good condition Oh, there we go. Nice. So, there we go. They're just drifting off, and Nikki agrees with me that they are very pretty animals, and, and exactly, yeah, they are overlooked, but they are pretty and worth stopping and, and trying to kind of admire. And the thing about impalas is the amount of times I've stopped and looked at them and actually been lucky and found a predator because we've stopped with them is actually is quite scary. So it's a little trick if you ever doing a self-drive safari, stop for the impalas because that will be a very good idea. Right, Michael, you want us to check some of the other hyena dens? Well, Scott and I will certainly do that. I did check the one off Zoe's uh, last week during kind of TV show time. I was in that area and just thought I'd just go and poke my nose there just to check what's happening. Just because I've, I felt like I wanted to see what was going on. And unfortunately, no sign of anything at the Zoe's den. Doesn't look like it's been used at all, excavated, cleaned out, nothing. But the one on Philemon's cut line seems as though there's been a bit of activity there there's a number of hyena tracks going in and out and that was even prior to Tundi's kill so it's not because Tundi's had an impala there it's you know they seems to kind of be as though they're scoping it out again and then just trying to think the one off from Vubu I checked also about two weeks ago nothing really happening but I will go past there again um, the one off Gallagher shortcut we can most certainly have a look at I haven't been there for a long time uh, I'm just trying to think where else the others are the one off um, Cheetah cut line I checked also last week because I was following tracks for Shadow and Cub there so I did check there was no sign of anything there either so it seems as though most of them are not active at the moment I'm 99% sure that Madam and Pretty are not denning here on Juma that they're off on the moment or, and are somewhere on Hoffman's or Arethusa So, Mark, you were wondering what animal has the most nutrients for a lion, given that we were just watching the impalas. Well, I think it depends on the time of the year, and it depends on the environmental conditions. But generally, zebras are very, very good, because they've got a very big fat layer, funny enough. It seems very odd, but zebras do have this yellow fat, and so that's very nutrient-rich. Um, you'll also find hippos are pretty good. The lions will tuck into hippos quite extensively. Um, good. In winter, impalas must be better. See our turn around. Okay. Tracks for lions. All right, so 
and unfortunately there's some gremlins but just on my right hand side here I just saw all the buffalo tracks going across and it seems as though the lions obviously were following so there you can see a lion track for a female that is over there it doesn't look very large as you can see so I think this is one of maybe the sub adults from the Inkahuma pride that might have walked through I just want to double check all of this and, and make 100% sure but it's definitely a lioness has also walked here for sure so I want to just check around but it looks as though they've gone into Simambili and have crossed out and so while I try and work out what actually went on here and who went where and whether or not these lions are still on our side of the world or if they've done their usual trick and just gone straight into Simambili let's go back across to Ralph and see if he's had any luck with the tawny cats Yes, thanks, Tristan. And it seems you 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 found a lion track, and uh, well, I've just managed to find a couple of lions. I will see if we can get a little bit closer in a minute. But let's just um, have a look out in front here. If, if Archie just zooms in there with our lovely zoom lens, and we've got a couple of male lions. I wonder if this is the Kichwa boys, two of three. And these are the ones that we have been seeing recently with the Marsh Breakaway Pride and we're not too far from where we last saw them. Uh, I'm still looking for that, the one with that pom-pom-less tail as they watch the warthogs run past. At least they're up and their heads are not on the ground. So, And lovely with that elephant there in the background too. Lovely seeing that. And they've been watching all the warthogs go past. So they might be a little bit hungry. Yeah, it's a lovely comments there, folks, with the uh, people saying the elephant in the background being amazing. Now, I just wanted to go quickly back to um, that question on the hornbills. How long do they live? Uh, we did a little bit of research, and we also had some comments coming in from, uh, I think it was a George, who said that they live up to 30 years. Now, that's in the wild, and we found out that they live up to 70 years in captivity. Activity. So, one of the birds that live very extended lives um, and they have between one and three eggs and uh, it is very, they also have siblicide, so very similar to that of a lot of your raptors and it's normally only one and a maximum of two that of the chicks that would actually survive to adulthood and then that is happening only every few years so their breeding is very slow and once you start to get them on the decline it's very difficult to turn that around and that is one of the reasons why they are very rare they're endangered and we need to try and protect the ground hornbills especially with their habitat and their nesting areas being um, cut down and there's not much place for them anymore. A lovely view that of the Olololo escarpment. Now Raylan asking the question, how many male lions are usually in a group? Raylan, in my experience, it's generally between three and five, uh, especially out here in the, in the Mara. Um, it seems like these coalitions are, are quite big. Um, but if, for instance, in the Kruger Park, it seems to be averaging around two or three. Um, and and in, in, the, in the smaller reserves, you can have a lot of prides being dominated by just one male. But I think it seems to be that the, 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 the best number is a minimum of three males, because then obviously that as a coalition is going to be stronger than two or one, uh, because if you've got those numbers behind you, you're generally going to be able to win the battle and be able to take over an area or territory. So, and this Kichwa males, I think it's three of them, that's the ones that I have now become accustomed to, if it is the same ones, and we just have a look at them up front there again, they're still looking like they might be willing to hunt, with their heads up, they are interested in the few warthogs that have been running past, so nice to see that they are up and awake, 
not lying flat and then there's always the opportunity of them doing something special. I am going to in a minute try and get a little bit closer Now Bella, you're wondering if we've seen Scarface lately. I haven't seen Scarface at all. So I'm still waiting for that meeting. And uh, I, I do believe that it has been a little while since anybody has seen Scarface as well. So um, maybe today's the day. We are going to head into the direction uh, and in, into the area that he, that he generally hangs around. But these are male lions that can move. Um, quite substantial distances and uh, right now I'm going to try and get a little bit closer remember we're in area that is not off-roading allowed so I've got to always look to see if there is a track not just um, game tracks uh, leading towards these males and I don't know if we're going to find one that is leading particularly straight towards them but uh, just here in front of us we've got a, a nice view of a topi and uh, these are also in that that family of the tsesebi, the hartebeest and these are the sprinters of the bush they are the fastest of all the antelope in that group and I think the tsesebi being the fastest of the lot and I think they can reach speeds of up to 80 kilometers an hour and that would be probably at about 45 I think uh, 45 miles an hour 45 50 miles an hour which is extremely fast for an animal and um, so the cheetah the lions and the rest they've all got to have themselves really well prepared to be able to catch one of these because you can see from the build a typical sprinter like build where they've got a reasonably front, uh, uh, strong front quarters but extremely powerful rear quarters. And remembering that antelope all run right on the tips of their toes so it does assist for making their speed that much more. Remember when you do athletics and you and you do sprints your coach he always tells you to run on your toes and antelope are doing that permanently. So, let's continue a little bit along the road. I do still want to try and find a road that is going to be taking us towards those lions and try and get a little bit closer to them, but we'll have to see. In the meantime, as I was saying earlier, very different conditions here in the Masai Mara and the Mara Triangle to what um, Tristan was talking about because we've been sloshing around in the mud. I've been trying my best not to get stuck and for the time being I've succeeded but I do think that at some stage I'm going to get nicely stuck in the mud because um, those, those people that say um, they've never been stuck, they've never been 4 by 4 -ing. Uh, Emma Brown, you're wondering what am I enjoying most about the Masai Mara um, that isn't Juma? Well, I think to start with, Emma, it's it's lovely to have this lovely open uh, areas that you can see for for very far and you can actually spot the game from quite a big distance and it's, it's just a completely different habitat and wow look at this we've got a road heading straight towards these lions um, but Emma that that for me I think for the for the offset has been what has been nice a totally different uh, uh, habitat where there's lovely open fields um, as opposed to Juma which which is quite thick very special in that as well um, but you've got to work a little bit harder inside the thickets um, at Juma to be able to actually find the game and they can literally be just you know 50 meters away from you and you can't see it because of the thickness of the of the vegetation whereas here look at it I mean you you, you do get an opportunity to spot things from quite a way off as we've done with these lions now if they were this distance away from us uh, at Juma they, we would have driven straight past them you know because we saw them from probably about three kilometers away. Uh, we've got this male here who's snoozing nicely. We've got all three of them. I don't want to wake him up too much from his slumber. And I would like to 
see which individuals these are. I, once again, I'm, I'm assuming it's the Kichwa males, but uh, the one absolute giveaway for me now is that that one individual without uh, the pom-pom and the end of his tail. And uh, it does seem like it is them because we've got two very dark maned males and the other one slightly less, which does correspond with the colors that I saw on the three males. And now with the density of these lions here in the Maasai Mara, it could well be another group of three. Who knows, but I'm assuming that it's them. We'll wait for one of them to flop his tail out and then we can check out. I'm, I'm assuming it's that one on the left uh, who we can actually see his face. I think that might be the one with the pom-pom-less tail, but we shall see. A lovely scarred face, always male lions, got the scars, the battle scars from feeding and fighting with each other. We've got all three of them here. It's a shame they've put their heads down now, but that's wildlife for you. They're not on command. And this one closest to us is completely flat out now. Uh, Philip, you're wondering, thanks for your question, you're wondering if um, if contact raw or a territorial raw sounds similar or the same. Uh, the contact raws, they they are quite a lot different to the territorial roar. A territorial roar is literally making as much noise as possible and normally stamping your authority, uh, whereas a contact call, we don't generally say is a contact roar, um, it's more of a oh, 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 whereas with the with the um, with the roar, it's coming deep from the from the belly also. So they've also got that, and it's 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 a much more resonating noise than the contact. Oof, oof, where, whereas the the territorial is, a, if if that makes any sense. So that for me is the difference between the two. One resonating slightly more than the other. But um, it's always it's always a challenge sitting with flat cats, and as they can spend such a long time doing exactly what they're doing now, which is quite literally nothing. So we always wonder if we should hang with them. And. Yes, all the viewers crossing fingers, hoping that one of these is the famous Scarface. I think those two up the front there looked like they had both their eyes intact. But the one on the right, I didn't get a complete view on. So, I don't know. And this one in front of us, um, lying on the ground flat out. Uh, he's melting away into the grass. Um, he's, he's also obviously been a little bit difficult to see. Now, I'm not getting my hopes up because I do think that it is those three Kichwa males, but I tell you what, I am going to be heading into the area where Scarface has been apparently hanging around, I don't know, this is all new for me, So, but I am heading into the area that is, everyone has told me that he has been, so we might be lucky. And this, uh, he actually moved, he lifted his head, uh, they put it back down. Okay, and for us to pass him, we'd have to possibly wake him up. But oh, look over there, Archie! One of them's lifted his head up. Let's see if we can spot both his eyes. Yep, it looks like they're both intact, so it doesn't look like scar or scar face to me. I think I'm not sure if it's scar or scar face. I might be able to 
we'll go with that. And that's not him. Because I do believe it's his right eye that is missing. And there we can definitely see that that is not him at all. But still a very good looking male that. <laughs> now, Naomi, you're wondering if uh, uh, mimicking animals is part of the initiation process of becoming a guide. Um, it hasn't been sort of in the initiation, but it has. It has been. Um, a lot of guides. The longer you you guide, the more you imitate. I think, and so. And I, I would definitely say that I'm not very good at it, but I, I have heard a lot of these sounds very often, so I do try my best. But uh, yeah, I think I think um, the way that I I throw myself around and the antics are probably are probably more amusing than the sound itself. Uh, but as you would have seen in my introduction with the uh, green wood hoopoos, uh, I do like to do a little bit of imitations but I wouldn't say that they're that great. Right now Archie do we sit with these lions or do we head out? If you look out over to the left I've just seen a little group of interesting birds there as well Archie. It's a whole bunch of black-headed herons. Uh, Mark, you're wondering, are there any white lions in the park, or leucistic lions, as they're also called? Uh, I don't think that there are any in the Mara. I have never heard of any white lions here, um, but I could be wrong. I know that there has been some in the Sabi Sands, and they're actually particular to that area. Um, and I remember that white lions, or leucistic lions as they're called, they are not albinos, as I'm sure you would know. But just for those that don't, they are not albinos, because albinos do not have any pigment in their skin. Um, white lions are leucistic, so it's a recessive gene and a very little pigment. And normally they have blue eyes, which means that... that that slight bit of pigment does then sh show through. Now like with these black-headed herons, you also get a very dark or melanistic form of lions and, and leopards as well. And the Eastern Cape area of South Africa is where naturally occurring leucistic leopards like black panthers occur. But you can see with these black-headed herons, they are not like the grey herons and, and most of the other herons that frequent water holes, catching frogs and fish. These herons are very much out on the grassy plains. They will also go where there's a little bit of marshy areas too because they will eat a little bit on frogs and fish, but generally they're more insectivorous. So you'll find them out on the plains and you watch them and if you are lucky, you see them start wobbling their neck massively before they stab. Right, folks, now I'd like to pose the question to you. And while we're sitting here watching these black-headed herons move through the plains, would you like us to sit here and wait and see what these lions get up to? Or would you like us to move along and see if we can find Scar? So while you're sending through the answers to that, let's send you across to Taylor and see what she is up to for the meantime.
Okay, welcome back folks and uh, we've just uh, got some gremlins as always there are some some problems uh, with the internet and so on with, uh, that is out of our control but I'm sure that everybody's working hard to get that back online but uh, we're still sitting here with these mail lines and please send through your requests as to if you would like me to sit here and see if these mails wake up or if I should head off and see if we can find Scar or any of the other individuals which is always a gamble because we don't know if we are going to find the other ones so sometimes better to stay but if we stay we'll never know if we went if what we would find so <laughs> let's put it to the vote we we'll see how many yeses or no's or should we stay or should we go you can tell me I'm happy to do either. Now, Jacqueline, you're wondering if lions dream. Well, I can tell you that I think that lions don't dream of hunting because they merely just do it. But uh, I think that they do probably have some small dreams. Maybe they dream of, of warthogs running through the grass and. Uh, them chasing them I don't know but there there has been times when I've seen lions like with um, like with dogs at, at home and little kitty cats they do sometimes get into a little bit of a almost a running motion but um, yeah uh, I think that you would have to actually monitor their brain activity while at sleep to be able to fully understand whether they dream or not. I'm sure there must be some kind of imagination or some some brain activity going on while they sleep. All right, it seems an overwhelming uh, we should move on and see if we can find Scarface. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. And while I'm doing that and off we go, I'm going to send you over to Tristan and we'll see what's happening with him. Well, we're sitting here at the hyena den and very little is happening at this stage. It is all very quiet. It's just a gaping hole in the termite mound with nobody sitting at it this morning. Now, I said I wasn't sure it would be active and the reason why is because it's it's quite warm already and so maybe that little one has just gone inside and probably would be better to come here first thing in the morning these days rather than later in the morning like we have now. And if you're wondering what happened with our lion tracks and buffalo tracks, well, it looks like the buffalo were chased into Simbambili by maybe two lionesses. It's, it's not clear, but it's, it's one definitely, and then it looks like there was a second one. Chased them in, and then the buffalo came back again. So I don't know if it's the Nguma pride. I'm not quite sure what the situation is there. But anyway, they unfortunately, the lionesses have crossed into Simbambili as well, so we're not going to be able to follow those tracks any further. And nothing comes back with the buffalo tracks, which is a bit of a shame. I was hoping that there would be some that would follow the buffalo back outside. And the buffalo have gone north into Manjaleti, and it seems that little corner is almost the bane of our existence because the buffalo and lions tend to be using it like a highway and tormenting and teasing us with tracks there most days. Right, well I think the, the hyena den obviously is not active so we're going to probably carry on. I've checked both sides of it. There's really very little happening. So I want to try and see if I can have a little look and see what else is around. Josh, you're wondering if termites swarm like ants. So, in terms of their movement around the mound itself, if they are there and you go poking about, then yes, you'll find that all the termites, particularly the soldiers, will come out and the workers will start going down. But you do get a nice big concentration of them together. So, yes, they are in big groups, particularly if they're building or working on the mound itself. So, you do see that. And then also, if you catch them early in the morning, you can often find them on the roads and you'll find big clusters of them together, much like ants walking in a long line so they are in big groups and let's remember to build a structure like that is millions of termites it's not just thousands it's millions of them so they are in big colonies together and so I suppose it's very similar to ants in that ants are also you know in big groups as well hmm I wonder when we are going to see 
like a Juma. I just keep thinking about it. It's been so long since I've seen it. It'd be nice to see how big those little ones have gotten and whether or not they're doing okay and, and what's happening with this other lioness that's been reported as being pregnant. Um, now I do apologize if there was some breakup in my speech, it's not me, I promise I don't have a stutter this morning, it's just we've still got these gremlins that are riding on Rusty, I don't know what's going on, but hopefully they'll disappear by this afternoon. So Mary, I haven't seen any tracks of the little cub there on the road. I did see a number of tracks for adults going in there from the last night. So that's good news. If the adults are going there, there's a reason for it. If at the end of the day the little one wasn't alive, then you probably have a situation if Intima is running around with the adults. We know Intima was yesterday at that kill. Then there would be no real reason for anybody to come back here. So there is adult female hyena tracks going there. There is also, it looks like Intima's tracks. But I didn't see the small one, I must be honest, I didn't see those tracks there and, and I would be very surprised if adults were going there if those little ones, if that little one wasn't still alive. So I'm holding out hope. Like I say, it wasn't the best time for me to go and check. It was a little bit late in the morning. I should have been there probably first thing around sunrise. That's normally a good time to go have a look at a den site for hyenas. It gets a bit warm and then they go inside and they just sit in the shade inside the den itself and then you can't see them. So hopefully it's still alive. Hopefully all is okay. I'm just trying and cling on to the positive side of life rather than going down the negative way. You know, that's uh, some say we should be realists, and while that's okay, it's always good just to rather be positive about things. And it's been a tough year already, so let's rather keep it on the positive side when it comes to our animals because, like I say, it's not been easy for the number of animals that we've unfortunately lost this year. It's been a sort of difficult year throughout the Sabi Sands, not just here at Juma. There's been a number of losses of quite iconic figures, both in Mala Mala and Londolozi, south of us, so, you know, these things happen and I suppose it is part and parcel of what we do and the fact of the matter is we, you know, we follow these animals so much it's hard not to get vested in their sort of interests and, and vested in their way of life and, and it becomes quite sad when they disappear or you know something happens to them so let's hope our little one is fine it's I mean it's obviously it seems as though the, the sibling is no longer with us and that sibling was looking really weak at one stage so I'd have been surprised if it had made it and I wonder if maybe that other sibling didn't cannibalize it and just you know, kill it and eat it. It wouldn't be unheard of within hyena society and, and particularly if it's struggling to find food then it might just do that. Right, let's see. Emma, you're wondering if I have a favorite animal where I am? Most certainly I do. I, my favorite animal is a leopard, hands down. No questions asked, but I also have a favorites within the leopard community that we have here, which is a shameful sometimes to say, but it is the way it is. And so my favorite female is Tandy, even though she's been rather difficult of late and has really given me the runaround and doesn't seem to want me to see her very much at all. She's my favorite female and it's that's part of the reason why is because she is so feisty and she is a little bit on the kind of edge side and you, you know you're always constantly having to really look for her and, and it takes effort to find her which is I don't know there's something about that I like, I like the fact that she's not just kind of stumbled upon her and that's just that you know so she's my favorite female and then my favorite of the boys is Tamba who has also deserted me of late which is sad because he seems to be hanging around quite far south at the moment and so I was really hoping that he would start coming back into this area and I suppose with his mom having a new cub the chances of that was very slim. I just thought he might stick around Chitwa a bit more but it seems as though Hosanna has kind of taken that over and Tumba is now just kind of doing his own thing a little south of that so I don't know hopefully he'll come back I'd, I'd love to be able to still see him um, and that's it really I mean of the really males Anderson has got to be still maybe not a favorite but just so impressive that it's hard not to like him because of his size so he's and those are kind of the three my top three leopards that I have in this area and Ferg on camera if you were wondering he's a wild dog man he's uh, an individual who likes all the dogs so Ferg is with Brent and James in, in that department I'm not sure what Scotty is actually I think Scotty is also a leopard man I'm not 100% 
Noel seems to be just everything and anything as long as it moves. Um, Taylor is elephants, so we had a broad spectrum. Jamie, what's, what's Jamie? I'm actually not sure what Jamie is either. But what we do, we've that bit. There is our other species of leopard, which is our leopard tortoise, and this is a rather large individual. I can't. I mean, it could be the upper spectrum of a male in terms of size or a mid-sized female. It's not really easy to tell without actually seeing the tail or seeing the underside of them. Um, the tail is, is different in male and females. It's slightly longer. And then you'll find on the shell itself there will be a little dent on the underside and that will indicate male so without picking them up you wouldn't really be able to tell that and we don't pick the tortoises up even now it's lush and green and, and theoretically you know it's it's a little bit more summery but we won't pick them up because they release a liquid out of their bursa sac and that liquid is life-sustaining for a tortoise and as i was talking about earlier is that it, we don't have a situation where we've got a lot of water just lying around and so picking up a tortoise is very dangerous at this time. It's better just to try and keep the tortoise safe and rather just view it from here. And, and we've got an epic view of him anyway, or her, um, as we sit here. It's a very relaxed tortoise. It's right next to the road and it's just watching us as it goes about their business. I actually really like tortoises. They're funny little creatures. They remind me of tanks now i i know that might sound odd but they just kind of crash and bash their way over vegetation and and kind of just move along without really too much of a care and it's like they engage four by four and off they go now nikki in fc who's wondering is that it's breathing as its kind of neck is going back and forth yes that's when it's breathing that's kind of the movement of its neck that is happening so as it's taking in air and exhaling that's why that neck is moving the way it is there we go four by four low range engaged up the little bank we go and it's amazing and those little claws that they've got they get nice traction and it's it's exactly like having a differential lock on our vehicles they're just able to kind of engage it and go over rather steep things with even with vegetation in the way there we go you can see up the bank and off into the grass wonderful thank you for that tortoise always nice to see these guys it makes me smile always uh, reminds me of that book that was written by Roald Dold is your trot and that's why I always think of, I don't know why I always think of that book when I see tortoises I suppose it's because it's all about tortoises actually right well have a good day we know that the get into quite regularly and also they need to stay away from Masana Masana is also and Tom actually the two of them are both little tortoise thieves and they will try and find them I suppose thieves is not the right word but tortoise devourers is probably better now I just saw a little impala lamb go bounding over the road now it could it be because of our vehicle wouldn't it be nice if wild dogs came bounding along Fergus that would be nice I'm sure you would be happy it wasn't an impala lamb, it's a steenbok. It's looking very twitchy with life. There it goes, bounding off. Very elegant bound. 10 out of 10 for form as it goes trotting away. Well done. The hyenas would be very... very oh, it's wire, but they were having a standoff. It, is, it seems like two males. So here's another male just here on our right. So the one that was bounding off was a male. Maybe that's why it was running. They were having a little territorial dispute because Steenbok are very territorial animals. They will make sure that they chase away any others because at the end of the day they've got to make sure that their females are protected. They mate for life and so they don't want to have a situation where there's too much competition. Maybe that's why there's a bit of chasing going on. There we go. Also very good form crossing the road. And here's the female. She's just come out. It's just Steenbok jumping out of everywhere. It's all happening. Whew. All right. Take a deep breath. Let's not cal calm down to a panic. It's just madness. As we stop, things are just bursting out everywhere. Sorry, Steenbok. Have I ruined this love triangle? Maybe there's been a bit of infidelity here that's been taking place. And now our Steenbok are in a little squabble. Oopsie. Well, maybe we did the good thing and, and just broke it all up. 
rides while I go and check around for other different things and get away from this scene of infidelity. Let's go back across to Ralph, who I think is also meandering his way around the Mara. I say welcome back because uh, we, we just um, swimming through the marshland here and I hope that this road doesn't go too close to these elephants because it is quite difficult to stop when we're driving like this. It's getting rather deep and we do need to keep moving so I hope that we're not going to disturb these elephants too much. If I have to I will stop but we will most likely get stuck then. So. If I can just drift a little bit off here, we've got a fantastic little playing with these elephants. Nice little jousting between the youngsters. Now, as I said, we might um, actually get stuck after this, but we've got a spade with us, we've got a high lift jack, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to make a plan. Archie and myself, there's two of us, so no worries. And I tell you, the only thing that has killed more people than hippos and elephants in the African bush is a high lift jack. So that's a piece of equipment that you do need to know how to use. Because I've seen many injuries from guides who don't really know how to use them. Nice little playful scene with the youngsters. Very nice Hujo. It seems it's an elephant morning today. With Tristan having lots of them all around the vehicle and now we're having a lovely little sighting here with these youngsters too. Really playful and also once again all the play, teaching them the lessons for when they're adults and they need to do it for real. It's, um, getting all the muscle memory, but it is fun. <laughs> so remember with the with the little babies like that you can you can very easily tell once they're over a year old because those ears they they cross over on the top of the head up until about a year old. Uh, thanks for your comments, uh, jousting baby Ellie's. Thanks very much for that. Absolutely, look at this, eh? They're really having a full go at each other while the adults get down to business of feeding. The youngsters all playing. Not a care in the world. Oh, that's really fun to watch. Jousting baby Ellie's. Look at that. So again, the ears out, trying to make themselves look bigger, and that one, the younger one, being a little bit clumsy, slipping in the mud. <laughs> With the flay grass waving in front of them. A little bit of trunking. So working the muscles in the trunk, it's like great fun. Wrestling match. Uh, and he's, uh, he's pushing him back saying go on. And start something you can't finish. <laughs> the younger one looks like he's a little bit more willing to keep going. What a lovely scene that is. Well Heather, I absolutely agree with you that you could sit and watch these elephants for a very long time. It's it's very interesting to watch. It's kind of like, for me, watching baboons. They are fascinating. And there's all the different social behavior going on. A little bit, and it generally seems like the the mix of of ages is is you know they 
it's uh, all around a similar age that uh, they are sort of interacting. There's little youngsters, very similar age, and then you've got the slightly older ones that also interact on a, on a different level. And then the adults all just getting down to the business of feeding. I don't have time for all this play malarkey. Yeah, and there's there's a couple of decent sized females in here. I'm imagining that she's the big one that we just saw was one of the matriarch. The matriarch. But this youngster's still having a full go at it. Scratching his foot on the ground, he's got his tail out. That is a real aggressive sign, that. Yo. Yes, how big is that, eh? Look at him go. <laughs> if you can't do it forwards, well, do it backwards and kick him from behind. <laughs> And that, normally with the adults, when the tail goes out like that, that's a very dangerous sign because it's an extreme sign of stress and heightened anxiety. <laughs> this guy's having a full go. Now, if that was an adult, I would be very worried. But <laughs> this little youngster. Well, oh, well, right. We'll just hey, and a little trumpet. Wow! <laughs> ah, he's gonna go and sit next to mom now. Ah, now the rest are getting involved. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's little trumpets going on as well. Sooner or later, the adults are going to say, right, that's enough. Oh, but the youngster's still going for it. There he is. He's having a go at anything he can see. Look. My tail's still standing straight out. character here he is so, but you can see he's starting to get quite good use of that trunk and that's generally at about a year's old and the ears then drop down also onto the side of the head whereas before a year they sort of do cross on the top that's the two indicators that you can see around a year the use of the trunk and those ears being down the side of the head as opposed to crossing over on the top This is the best and most entertaining part of an elephant's life, I do find. When you watch them like this, they are quite clownish. <laughs> As they continue on feeding through the grasses, a little bit more jousting off to the right there, Archie. A couple of younger, uh, uh, older individuals, but they're also having their playtime. Seems it's a, it's a morning for it. Everybody wrestling and jousting in between feeding. Get a couple of mouthfuls of grass and then a bit of argy bargy in between. So I think I'm going to start up very shortly and see if we can get past these elephants as well as not get stuck in the mud. Um, but in the meantime, I think we're going to put you over to Taylor, who's got some of our feline friends. 
we do finally happy valley has turned out to be quite happy now this is the pride of lions that i was searching for there's a number of cubs if i'm not mistaken Manu, how many did we count one day like nine cubs nine it was nine hey we're just trying to remember it was ages ago with a couple of females and there they are and then we've got some more and we spotted them from i don't know how far away i mean i've been driving off-road probably for the last 10 minutes or so uh trying to get closer to them but then i hit a lugger and then we, we spotted these this young male that's sitting up on the termite mound and he does there is another one but he's laying in the long grass so you can't really see him right now and the two boys here that they must be about three years old maybe maybe pushing three and a half years old they don't look particularly large uh, they're keeping a close eye on those other cats down there if I'm not mistaken I thought I'd seen a big male uh, amongst that pride a uh, may yes I think he's the one on the, is he on the right no that's a lioness maybe I didn't see a big male lion I think I made that up looks like just the girls that are there now um, but they won't be welcomed by the females they won't want really want to have anything to do with these young boys it would just mean a trouble uh, for their little ones maybe that's why they're on the move maybe they're worried about these boys coming in and killing those young cubs which is a reality out here and it happens more often uh, than you think and than what we actually see if we're following all the different prides of 24 7 i think we would see a lot of that but isn't that just a beautiful view i was feeling a bit sad at one point i was a bit disheartened i suppose that's probably a better way to describe it because we've been searching 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 and we weren't having any luck and it's obviously just because i haven't been down here for such a long time the animals have moved into different areas but we found them which is really quite cool isn't that lovely though well uh, I don't know who these young boys are. There's so many nomadic lions around at the moment and, and all around the same age. It's hard to keep track. Now, Anik, you're wondering what are all these small hills? So you're looking at the termite mounds and, and this area in particular is filled with lots and lots of termites and that's exactly what this young male lion is sitting on as well. Now, obviously we don't really get to see the termites they're living within the mound and underneath the ground remember with most termite mounds what you see is only a third of the mound and two-thirds is actually below the surface of the earth very much like an iceberg but they make for the perfect spot for lions leopards cheetah uh, even the herbivores to use as vantage points to see over the tall grass mm, beautiful hello boy got a couple of scars on him which is not un unusual to see on a male lion of his age i'm sure he's been avoiding the claws and teeth of the bigger boys that roam around in this area you see a couple of old scars but that's very very nice now what i really want to do though is i want to try and go around to get to the pride that's up on the top of that hill and uh, to go and have a closer look because they're quite a nice pride um i just haven't quite figured out how we're going to do that i think we'll have to go the scenic way around off to the left to try and find a spot to cross the lugger and then back round and up again and because they're on the move first when i saw them though i thought oh, they must be keen maybe they're looking for something to eat but now that we've seen these young males i think that they were probably quite close to one another and the lionesses uh picked up obviously that there's young boys around and that their cubs would be in danger so they're moving them away very quickly trying to put as much a distance between uh, the two as possible Okay, well, we're going to make our way around and head up towards the top of the hill where the rest of the pride is. Tristan is bumbling about in the sabi sand. Tristan, I have a request for you. Can you please find me a lion's eye flower? Sure thing, Taylor. No worries. I shall try and do so for you. I'll look now to find one. Otherwise, it will be this afternoon that I shall try and whip it out for you, Taylor Mac, because, well, that's what you're asking for. So, I'll try and just see if I can find one for you. There normally are some in this area, although it's it's been quite hot, and so I think some of them have been absolutely blitzed by the, the sun yesterday. Now, I saw a couple in this area a few days ago, so let me just double check. I'm just scanning on the edges of the road, although there's a big debate that's raging at the moment between James, myself and Steph. 
and Byron as well was involved in this as to there's two different species of flower that we get here that look almost identical in terms of the actual flower itself and everyone refers to lion's eye but there's also what's called a roadside pimpernel now roadside pimpernel is a very similar looking plant there's just some differences within the How are we now? Are we good now? We're on now. Excellent. So my mic pack is now playing around. I don't know what's going on. I'm just being attacked by gremlins everywhere. But I was what I was talking about was the, the roadside pimpernel and lion's eye. Now they're two actually different species. They're not the same plant, but we keep using its blanket kind of rule on them. And actually most of them, Steph and I are of the same opinion, is that roadside pimpernel is a very good name for it because most of the roadside pimpernels are the ones that occur along the edge of the road whereas the lion's eye we tend to find in disturbed areas now there goes a hoopoo that just flew away didn't race very good flew there was a hoopoo on the road and it flew away so lion's eyes we tend to find in disturbed areas so maybe somewhere like quarantine would be a good place but the ones along the edge of the road tend to be this roadside pimpernel so we're going to be a bit careful now and I know Taylor who will give me a lot of trouble if I give the wrong flower so I'll have to do this properly and make sure I find the right lion's eye and so that might take me that only you get it this afternoon we'll just have to see because otherwise miss mccurdy will be on my case and we can't let miss mccurdy be on my case she's been up in kenya and uh, i've managed to avoid getting too much uh, in the way of abuse from that side of the world so we'd like to keep it that way of course when taylor's here between the two of us it's constant banter and it doesn't stop very much at all and it's always light-hearted and meant in the best possible way even though we do joke around a lot it's it's not like we're being ugly to each other but it's like I say let's try and keep it civil for while she's in the Mara and I'll try and find the flower for her this afternoon I think I'm looking around I don't see any you see any fig there should be quite a few there should be quite a few around they were a few days ago maybe let's just check the middle road on quarantine I did see some there yeah, maybe James Henry is the problem I don't know. There we go. Sorry about that. I don't know. My mic pack is all over the show today, so we'll just leave it there and hope that it doesn't do its nonsense again. But I was saying that James Henry, I think, has picked every single lion's eye that there was in the Sabi Sands and potted every single one of them for our TV shows. So I don't think there is a sign of them anywhere to be seen. I'm looking on quarantine now and it's there. There's not one lion eye anywhere to be seen. So we'll just have to blame James. I think that's far better. Is it not my lack of flower spotting ability it's much easier to blame james henry in this regard what do you think Vic? he's not here to defend himself so scientific fact you say not blaming forensic evidence yes because ferg was there for all of the picking so ferg is the little mole that's giving me all the insider info so james if you if you are watching i'm sorry that we're blaming you but it's because ferg is selling you short and is telling me that you picked every single one and took them all from this area which is not surprising given the amount of potting soil that i saw being flung around on jigger as well as all over the drc I thought I'd find some here, but it doesn't look like any. No. 
I don't see any signs of them on this particular section. I was hoping this middle road is not a bad place for them. I have seen them here before, so it doesn't seem like there are any right now, but I will try and find some this afternoon. And so, unfortunately though, it's my time for myself and Ferg to head home, and we're going to leave you in the capable hands of Ralph and Taylor in the Mara, and I'm pretty sure that both of them will look after you just fine as they meander around for the next little bit and hopefully Taylor will get a much better view of those lions than what she had just now. But from myself and Ferg, we'll see you all this afternoon. Enjoy the Mara. Thank you very much Tristan and I uh, hope you enjoy your breakfast. Um, so we're just continuing along the road here and uh, still very marshy, still very wet. Luckily we didn't get stuck earlier, but I uh, tell you, I have been stuck many, many, many times. And one, one such time in particular, I remember when I was driving in the, in the Huab River with um, a whole group of guests and we had just seen some desert elephant and it was a lovely afternoon's drive and uh, I went through a sandy patch and then I dropped into a bit of a wet sandy patch and I got very stuck. Now the problem with these high lift jacks because obviously once you're stuck in that kind of situation is that you need to lift your tires up out of the hole that you've most likely made and hopefully you stopped early enough that you didn't dig yourself in too deep um, so you've got to lift your wheels up and you've got to put something solid underneath those wheels and clear the path out in front of the wheels in order for you to get out. Now the problem where we were was that there was absolutely no rocks which is quite similar to here in the Mara. So I had to leave the guests with the vehicle and go in search of branches or rocks or anything that I could find and it took me a very long time. To, um, to find some logs and rocks etc and by the time we actually got unstuck and back to camp it was quite late so it was quite an eventful day but luckily we had seen the desert elephants and everybody was happy so that all all's well that ends well and uh, right I'm gonna continue along here see what we can find but in the meantime let's go over to Taylor with those furry catted friends once more Really? Oh, I have no comms. Sorry about that, everybody. For some reason, I have absolutely no communication at all with Final Control on, which is bizarre, because I was just chatting to them a moment ago. Uh, we found some more lions. We found three more uh, sitting quite far away in the distance. So, my goodness, they, I, can't, I can't tell you exactly how many lions we've seen this morning, but I reckon it's, reckon it's well over 20 now uh, with the Paradise Pride from earlier. Uh, this is not the, the Happy Valley Pride that we saw with all the young cubs. This is another three, and they're exceptionally far away from us, and there's just too many obstacles for us to get around uh, to go to them. So I just wanted to have a, a quick look. I don't know which prides these are. I'm not familiar with the prides down here towards the uh, Tanzanian border. It's uh, oh, There's plenty, plenty, plenty lions around here. Well, clearly, as we've just seen this morning so hang on what is that it's just popped his head out I'm mean, just checking to see because that lion has also looked quite interesting I thought maybe a warthog was close by that's exactly what I was looking at it isn't it's a termite mound just protruding above the grass which can be a bit deceiving but they are looking around but again I don't know if they're looking at prey or if they've all, all the lions have spotted one another we know that they've got very good eyesight and they will be avoiding one another uh, today otherwise they're going to have conflict and animals don't like conflict because if you have conflict you can get hurt you can get killed all these types of things okay let's um let's have a quick look at those two oh you know it's okay <laughs> But then I'm going, I want to keep an eye out on this pride. I don't know where they've gone. They've gone up to the top of the hill, but we'll get them eventually. So I think this is going to be a very good spot for this afternoon as well. I think we're going to have lots and lots and lots of action. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to reverse back onto the road and try not 
hit a, be hit by another car and then I don't think there's any roads that go along there so we are gonna have to off-road so what I'll do is I'm gonna you can see there's some elephants just down off to the right there's quite a few three different groups uh, we're gonna have to go on the other side of them because they're sort of where the where the lugger is so we'll do that we'll move on from there and I'm like and uh, we'll go around and then we'll get the rest of the pride so everybody keeps trying to stop to talk to me but I can't talk to them while I'm live there, let's go um, I know you're gonna have to tell me when final control says something because I don't know why I don't have communication anymore nothing yet can we have a comms test please final control all the directors can someone talk to us so we can just see my radio is not going no Let me check my phone. Okay. Bizarre, my radio is not even going. Oh yeah, uh, we're gonna try and figure this out. It might just be that we're in a dodgy signal area. I'm gonna send you back across to Rolf and hopefully the next time you see us we'll be with a big pride alliance. Yes, thanks Taylor. And uh, we've got a lovely birding scene here with a Great white egret being fishing. He's been stabbing away at the fish. He's been quite successful in the last couple of stabs that he's had. He's come back with a couple of fish. You see there, he also uses his feet to test the waters. And moving over just a little bit to the right of him, there we've got a black headed heron who's also doing a little bit of fishing. So they do, as I say, do a little bit of fishing but they are more insectivorous and then heading off to the right of him and we've got some other birds in this marshy area here and over there we've got our request of earlier was for a white stalk but these are woolly necked stalks so not too far off, they've got white woolly necks, not the full white bodies like the storks that deliver babies. But uh, these are quite similar. And then just to the right of them, we've got the special white-faced whistling ducks. Always in groups, very rarely on their own. And this is quite a small group, in fact, normally a lot more than that. But, uh, and then as we come back and a little bit further across to the right, you can see the biggest goose that we get, the spur-winged goose. Aptly named because they've got spurs on the inside of their wings, which they literally use in fighting. And they spread their wings and smack each other the largest goose of the region. As geese do, they're also mostly vegetarian, so you'll be eating algae and all sorts of little plant matter. And there we go. Start to graze away. Lovely birding scene here. Oh, there the egret after something else again. So I'm still trying my best not to get stuck, but coming through the marshy areas takes us to lovely little settings and scenes like this. Wading birds. Often the most difficult areas to get to hold the most exciting things. Nice to see spurring geese. There's not, they're not, you don't get massive numbers of them, so it's always nice to see one or two. Now, Anna Marie, you're wondering if I've got a. 
famous uh, favorite uh, wading bird. Um, I'm trying to think. I do have a few. I love the flamingos, um, which obviously feed with their heads upside down. Um, but another one for me is the black egret, who does his um, typical wings out, making the shade and uh, for fish to come and take cover and refuge underneath before he then darts at them. And that is one of my favorite. Um, the other one, I've forgotten the name. I don't know if it's the, it's not a green-backed heron or one of the gallinules. Um, anyway, if any of you can remember it, I'm going to kick myself when I, when I do remember. But it's the bird that, that it can actually put bait for, for fish. They often take a little piece of bread or a little worm or anything and they put it in the water. And as the fish come, then they, they, they dart them. It's a fantastic sight to behold, and I've forgotten the name of it, but also like a, a, um, a little night heron or, or green-backed heron, similar, similar kind of little bird or little gallinule type, um, also a little wader, but fascinating to watch and that kind of behavior of the birds and almost intelligent to the way that they are laying bait or laying a trap for fish. Right, let's start up. We start to move through this marshy area again. Now Laura, you're wondering what do ducks and geese eat in the Mara? Well, generally ducks and geese are quite vegetarians. So they will mostly graze on little bits of grass and algae, etc. So quite similar to the ducks that you might find, uh, domestic ducks that are in the ponds, etc. Um, they, they will feed on the grass surrounding um, the, the water and, the, and that grows in the marshy areas. Now this is going to get interesting, folks. Hold on. over yet. Okay, the wonders of Diflock and Land Rovers. That was fun. That's uh, one of my most, uh, one of the, the best favorite things of mine. Sorry, Trista, I, I, I missed the, the first part of your question. Um, I'm just going to ask FC to repeat that for me because I'd love to answer your question. Um, I missed the first part of it as we... Okay, Trista, so I've got the rest, the rest of your question. Does it tend to rain more in the Mara or in Juma or vice versa? Um, I, would, I would say that it definitely rains a lot more um, up here in the Mara, um, closer to the, the equator and very high up. There's, they've got uh, very big... Uh, afternoon thunderstorms and it does make for a lot of water coming through here. Um, it's actually a relatively low rainfall that you have in the low felt. Um, only a few hundred millimeters a year on average uh, in the low felt and here in in Kenya so millimeters sure folks I'm always I'm always confused between the imperial and the um, metric system so I've always got to try and and convert um, the couple of hundred milliliters I've never even looked at the conversion uh, what do you use in the states I think it's uh, gallons and um, the, the smaller uh, size of gallon, I would have to even now look that up. While we look at these at these hippo over here, I'm going to quickly have a look and just give you a nice conversion right there. As you see, a lovely big pod of hippos. So let me just get a nice conversion for you. And give it to you in, in 
something that you understand. Now, OD farming, you're wondering, do hippos spend more time in the water or on land? Um, OD farming, it does, it, it, it's pretty much split down the middle because they spend much of their time during the day in the water and then in the evenings, generally, they come out to graze. So it does seem that they're in the water for longer periods because that's Or very cool days, rainy days, you will then find the hippos out. So it's just in those days, rainy days, you will then find the hippos out. that they're actually then spending their time out of the water. But I would say it's it's, it's pretty half at a hundred cubic millimeters milliliters, being at about two point six gallons. But that's cubic, so that's quite a difficult conversion to make. But all I can say is that the rainfall in Juma is probably less than one and a half to two gallons of rain. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if that's how you guys measure it. So any of you, please just um, enlighten me on, on, the, on the conversions here. Uh, we talk about normally um, between one and five hundred milliliters um, of rain a year in, in the low felt, whereas up here in Kenya it can be a lot more. A lot more than that and as you can see the Mara River um, flowing very nicely through here and all the marshy areas now is the time of the sort of the small rains um, and later uh, and in the beginning part of the year sort of January February March even into April is normally when they have their larger rains Now, Mike, you're wondering, uh, comparing hippos to lions, is there a dominant male? Um, and yes, absolutely, there is a dominant male with, um, with hippos, and there is it, just like there is with with lions. But with with um, hippos, you generally won't have coalitions. You'll have one big dominant male, and he'll normally take over a little uh, area or a pond, um, normally near to where there is very good grazing, and then he would uh, have his harem of females. So, looking at this group here, I would imagine that this is one one dominant bull there's possibly a couple of younger bulls in the in the in the pod but as soon as they become sexually active or they start to push their weight around he'll then chase them away so as I say generally one big bull and this one seems to be quite successful because he's got a lot of females so the bigger the pod normally the bigger the bull and the more dominant and he would then, how that would start is he would normally um, dominate a particular pool which has got good resources in the area and then the females would come into the area and he would um, keep them there because of the resources that he is now being able to, to um, give to them in the area. So it's all down to resources. But very similar. Uh, it, it's quite similar with the, with the lions, also sort of around the resources. But um, you do generally have more of the coalitions that get together with lions, which you won't have with hippos. I don't know of any coalition type uh, behaviour going on with hippos. So that's not really what does occur. And the other day we were um, right near to the to the river here with the hot air balloon. We did actually land nearby. That's an Egyptian goose. Uh, normally quite common. Uh, we get them a lot in Juma as well. And it seems to me, uh, my impression is that we're getting a lot more Egyptian geese in areas 
especially where the Cape Clawless Otter has dwindled. Now their numbers have dropped drastically because um, especially in areas which is populated, people with dogs uh, and people living on river edges and on river courses, um, dogs generally uh, have a big influence on, on clawless otters and they would be big controllers of Egyptian geese in particular and in the last few years there's been a massive increase in Egyptian geese. So uh, I'm taking a hazardous guess at saying that it's correlated to their natural predator decreasing in number. Right, I think we can start up and continue along again. This has been a lovely little stop here on hard ground. I'm sure we're going to get back into the soft stuff again and we'll go on our drifting um, morning. We're going sideways in the mud. But we've been able to not get stuck for now, so let's hope we can keep that trend up. But a little bit of mud and stuckness is not bad either. Now Batman, you're wondering if that water is polluted from hippo feces? No, not at all. Obviously the hippos do defecate in the water, but it is very similar to that of rhino dung or elephant dung. It's actually quite organic. It's um, a lot of the fish actually swim around hippos, especially bream and catfish. They'll, they'll almost be feeding as the, the hippo is defecating. That brown color, is that, it's not, it's not that the water is polluted at all, it's just a lot of surface runoff um, from the soil in, in this particular area. So that means that you can see the color of the soil is pretty much the color of the water. Uh, it's quite a, a mix between sandy and clay soils um, because we do have basalt and granite uh, base rock here. So we've got a bit of a mix, but we've de definitely got quite a bit of clay in there too. So you can see that um, the color of the water is then reflected. So very similar to the color of the soil. So, and as I say, so it's just quite a muddy a muddy um, river and that's all but if there weren't hippos and crocodiles in there I would be having a swim whenever I need to do cool off but unfortunately we can't do that with crocodiles especially you can swim where there is hippos as long as you know where they are but uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a very famous story about uh, one of a, a, a famous safari guide and um, he was, there was a farm dam near to where he was working and obviously you know in these bushveld areas it does get very hot and there was one crocodile in this dam that they knew of and um, he wanted to go for a swim. So he had a look and he saw that the crocodile was on the other side of the dam sunning itself so he thought he'd go for a swim and that was when they realized that there wasn't only one crocodile in fact there were two and uh, the second crocodile grabbed him by his leg and he was lucky to get away with his life but he lost his leg and now they know that there were two crocodiles in there and um, a very famous safari guide because he's also got a little dog a little Jack Russell that has lost one of his legs as well so the two of them it's absolutely classic the, the safari guide with one leg and the little Jack Russell with three legs and he's called the little Jack Russell tripod so very apt Right, so we always remember, you've got to be very careful in rivers where there's crocodiles. Okay, I'm going to continue and see if we can catch up with Scar, but in the meantime, let's go over to Taylor, who does have some lions. Right here, everybody. I haven't said that for a while. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have comms with the final control at the moment, so I'm going to be using my mobile device to communicate. Fantastic, isn't it? That, that technology can uh, 
reach us all the way down in this little depression. Now we've made it around to that big pride of lions and we've discovered that there are five lionesses and seven cubs. So sorry, Manu and I got a bit excited. It wasn't nine, it was seven cubs. And it actually does look like they've eaten something now that we're much closer to them. So I wonder if they've maybe caught a warthog or something early hours of this morning because this lioness has got a little bit of, looks like she's wearing blush at the moment. Uh, you can see just a very, very, very faint shade of red. So I don't think it was anything particularly big, uh, just enough to give the adults a mouthful. The cubs look like they haven't eaten anything and they are on the move again and their lionesses are scanning the, through the tall grass I think hoping to f see another warthog. There was a warthog really close by uh, it was hidden in the grass so very lucky. It escaped. The lions didn't even see it but this is really really nice. I think this is going to be a winning pride to follow for this afternoon. It looks like they are heading back towards the areas that we were checking this morning. Their usual hangout on one of the luggers down here in the area we call Happy Valley. Brink calls it Happy Valley just because whenever you come here you see so many lions and there's normally cheetah around too. Uh, an abundance of game out here. But our girl has now moved away from her vantage point and is catching up with the rest of the pride. Very exciting this morning. So we are going to be staying out today, both Ralph and I. And we must remember, I just want to remind you now, uh, to keep an eye out for those live notifications uh, as we could be doing some action broadcasts, which will be cool. Don't you think that'll be quite nice? But now we need to play catch up. Manu, are you ready to do some 4 by 4 ring? Oh, mm, I'm not. Okay, we're going to try and go through this lugger. We need to get to the other side. Now, I'm hoping. I don't know if we're going to be able to cross it. I want to investigate and see where most of the lions cross quickly. Sorry, I shall keep checking my phone in a minute to see if any developments come through. Let's have a quick squiz here. Mm, lots of rocks. go over that big one. Uh, I don't know, it's a bit marshy on the, on the left. Let me try and keep my tires on the right on the hard ground. I'm just hoping hope it isn't, it isn't, it's not, it's too, not deep. too deep. Actually, Actually come, come come car. Car. You, can, you do can do it. it. Landies don't have as much power as what they used to. Yeah, we should be good. We should be able to cross here. Yeah. If we get stuck here, we're going to be in trouble. There's, There's no, no help, help for, for ages. ages. Right, big bump. But we're up and over. Whee! Look at us go. I'll clap for myself. <laughs> okay, now I need to do multitasking. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's been a very cool day out here. Uh, we're going to follow these lions. Like I say, keep an eye out for a live notification. They're looking for something to eat. For something so for the last couple minutes of the, the show, I'm going to send you back across to Ralph. Thanks, Taylor. And that's a great idea to be following those lions. Hopefully, I can still find Scar a little bit later. But um, it's nice for us just to look over the plains here. We've got a, a very big herd of elephants, all in a straight stripe, walking across the plains. And lovely. So, and they seem to be on the move. I wonder if they're coming down towards the river. A lovely view, that. Normally when the elephants are on the move like that, they are heading for something. Now, I've seen them moving through the desert like that as well, but for hundreds of kilometers, and they are on a mission. Every now and then you might see them stop to feed a little bit, but as you can see, there's a definite mission on the go there. So it has been a fantastic morning. We've seen a lot of elephants. A lot of those little babies. 
and Tristan seem to have a fantastic encounter. I'd love to see how that all unfolded with them all right next to the vehicle. Sounds like you guys had lots of fun with that. And then over to ours with the little babies jousting, playing around. And now we're seeing this big herd moving across the plain with an obvious mission. And with those la lovely balanities in the background, you can actually see the browse line where the elephants are able to reach, as well as the giraffe. That's where the foliage actually starts and it's flat from there so they've actually eaten everything that they are able just to get in terms of their reach and as they all file through rank and file so thanks to all the guys up in Juma we're heading towards the end of our show thanks Tristan thanks to the FC Thanks to Taylor. We're going to continue trying to find all sorts. Please join us this afternoon for this afternoon's drive. Thank you to all the viewers and we hope to see you again later. My name is Ralph Kirsten. This was Safari Live. Thank you and goodbye.